This episode is brought to you by Gempler's Farm and Home Store, family owned and based right here in Wisconsin. Shop Gemplers.com for winter workwear from Carhartt, Patagonia, and more. Clothing and footwear orders of $50 or more ship free with free returns every day. Visit the deals page at Gemplers.com for more offers. Welcome to the Moses Organic Farming Podcast. This is Chuck from Moses. Last week, we heard from Karen Jokla about pollinator conservation from a talk she gave at Blue Fruit Farm in August 2019. Today, we hear from another talk from that same day from Caitlin O'Connor. Caitlin is the Education and Outreach Specialist at Prairie Moon Nursery in Winona, Minnesota. Caitlin shares some principles about seed mix design and seed selection for native plantings for pollinator habitat and ecological restoration more broadly, and then goes over some specifics. This is the second in a series of three episodes on pollinator habitat, which will be followed by a post-podcast farmer chat with all the podcast guests from this series. This meeting will be Tuesday, December 15th at 10.30 a.m. Central Time. The link to register is in the show notes. As you're listening, take note of your questions so you can bring them to that meeting and get them answered. Let's get to it. I'm going to be talking a little bit more about good seed mix design for some of these native plantings. Um, So my name is Caitlin. I am the Education and Outreach Specialist for Prairie Moon Nursery. And Prairie Moon Nursery was started here at Wispoy Valley Land Co-op by folks who lived here back in, I believe it was 1982 that the nursery was officially founded. And we were down here in the valley until about 2008, where we purchased 40 acres up on the ridge and now our main facilities for seed cleaning, processing, sales, shipping are all happening um, up there on that 40 acres. But we manage about 100 acres of land for seed and plant production in Winona counties and Houston counties of Minnesota. But Prairie Moon Nursery is actually set up like a network of growers across the upper Midwest. And that allows us to get the species diversity that we can carry. Here, there's only so many habitats that are available to us. And if we expand our scope, out to other areas in the upper Midwest, that allows us to capture a lot more plant diversity with the different uh, habitats that are elsewhere. Um, So we have, I believe, about 80 consignees um, or partner growers with Prairie Moon, and it can be very uh, small scale. We have some consignees that maybe they have a very rare wetland fen on their property and they do maybe one or two species. And then we have guys in Northern Illinois who are running entire large-scale farming operations, harvesting grasses with combines, hiring whole field crews for the summer. So the scale is is really variable as to who is a consignee. But that network that is Prairie Moon is able to provide over 700 species of native plants for woodlands, wetlands, savannas, and of course, prairies. So we are going to cover some of the main aspects that you want to think about with good seed mix design. Some of these are already built into the standards that are in these governmental programs, but there's a couple of things that you might want to consider adding on to make these mixes even better for pollinators and even better for general ecological restoration purposes. So the basics are you want to match the right plants to the right place. And so we're gonna talk a little bit more about that concept in detail, right plant, right place. Um, So the first thing you wanna consider about the site condition is your soil moisture and your soil texture. So soil moisture is on a gradient and it goes from really, really wet to really, really dry. Think standing water, wetland soils, all the way up to ridge top, soils that are super thin, very sandy and gravelly, and sometimes can't even support trees. The the soil profile is so shallow. And then you also want to think about um, your soil texture. Now there is national data where you can get very specific soil information um, about your location that is freely available. But this information is a little bit more complicated and you really need to, even with your soil texture, you really need to think about what the moisture holding capacity of that soils are. 
because there are general moisture trends, but it's not consistent all the way through. So generally, if you have a very sandy soil, usually that soil is very dry. However, if you have sandy soil that is right at the water table, like maybe down in the city of Winona, they actually have really sandy soils that can be wet because they're so close to the water table that even though it's sandy and could be well drained, that water is seeping up from the bottom. Similarly, clay soils generally tend to hold more moisture, but depending on the composition of the clay and compaction and things, sometimes they can be pretty dry because that layer of clay might actually hold moisture back and not allow it to seep very deep. So there are nuances to soil moisture and soil texture, but you want to get a good idea of what that is. And honestly, the best way to know is to just go out there and look at it, you know, dig down, walk out there at various times of the season and just observe your site to see what that's like. And of course, you also want to think about sun exposure. Now, normally with these mixes through the NRCS and other federal contracts, we're assuming full sun for, because most farmland is not going to be shaded by trees. But however, you could have marginal acres that are partially shaded and there's going to be different appropriate plant communities for those different kinds of sun conditions. And then you also want to think about your slope and aspect. And so again, generally speaking, we think with these federal programs that you're going to have relatively flat ground. That is typically the case with places that have tillable acres, but especially in areas like the Driftless, there are marginal acres that are on slopes that people are using for pastures and sometimes even tilling, um, even if they're on a slope. So you can have sloped areas that are managed as farmland. And generally speaking, you're going to see a moisture gradient on that slope. Soils are going to be drier near the top. They're going to be wetter near the bottom. And so if you have a acreage that is in one of these programs that goes along a slope gradient, you're going to need to consider that because there's probably going to be a slightly different composition of species that want to hang out at the top of that hill. And there'll be another plant community that prefers the conditions at the bottom of the hill. And then the aspect um, is another important consideration. It's the direction that the slope is facing. Things that are south and western facing are drier. Things that are northern and eastern facing tend to be wetter. Okay, so always important to consider your historic geographic range and how much of a purist you want to be about restoring some of these acres. Um, oftentimes these programs are not purist at all. They allow co-mingling of native and non-native species. There's no requirement about how native is native, but you might want to consider that if you're doing a seed mix to try and stick to populations that were historically native in a certain area to get a more pure ecological restoration planting. And so one thing that is often in lots of these plantings is purple coneflower. It's a very iconic species found in a large portion of the Midwestern and Eastern United States. But actually in Minnesota, this, is, this plant was never historically recorded um, this far north. And so if you want to be a purist about your plantings, you might consider not having this species or maybe going with a species like pale purple coneflower, which is related, but it did get this far north. Plant diversity is really important in any kind of habitat restoration. And so um, it had been mentioned before that a lot of these old CRP plantings were almost exclusively grasses. They only had one component of this plant community diversity in them. And since then, we've learned a lot more about these native plant communities and how to recreate them. And so research and observation suggests that natural plant communities tend to have these categories of plants within them. And so if we're trying to mimic habitat restoration, it's good form to try and, and include at least one species that is represented in these groups. And so those groups are warm season grasses, also known as bunch grasses. They like to germinate and grow when the soil temperatures are high. You have cool season grasses. These are grasses that prefer to germinate when the soil temperatures are cooler. You have sedges and rushes, which are grass-like plants 
But botanically, we say sedges have edges, brushes are round, grasses are flat. Um, so botanically speaking, they have different morphology that classifies them as different graminoid species. So sedges and rushes are in their own category. You have legume forbs. These are flowering plants that are in the pea family. So they have the this, this special capacity to take atmospheric nitrogen and uh, synthesize it into nitrogen that can be uptaken by plants and used as a nutrient. And then you have the non-legume forms, basically everything else that flowers in a prairie. And so in a lot of what we see at Prairie Moon when we're filling orders for the NRCS is that you get your warm season grasses, those are required in pollinator plantings. You have your legume forbs, you need to have at least one legume that is in there. And then you need at least nine species, this might overlap with the legume, of three early blooming, three mid-season blooming, three late blooming. But it is not required to include cool season grasses or sedges and rushes in these mixes. And so these components are often missing from NRCS mixes. And if you're helping design someone or considering doing um, a similar thing for yourself, you might think about adding these two components in to make it a more holistic mix. Because it tends to be that if you don't purposely fill that niche, Mother Nature will fill that niche. And the things that are likely to come in on their own in a freshly disturbed site are things that are very likely to be weedy or invasive. Weeds and invasive species really like these disturbed niches and they will take an opportunity to take advantage of that open space in the plant community. And so if you can fill these, you have a less likelihood that you are going to get invaded by invasive species. And there's studies that show that, that as plant diversity increases, the risk of invasion from non-native species decreases. And as both Karen and Jim said, there's lots of studies about how the diversity of plants is also directly correlated to the diversity of other organisms, whether that's soil organisms, insects, birds, mammals, reptiles, amphibians. Native plants are the foundation of our ecosystem, and they can help build the soil and build the other biodiversity that happens above ground. And of course, um, there's also studies that show that having a wide diversity of plants also decreases the risks associated with climate change. And a more diverse planting has a better chance of adapting to those extremes, or at least having something in there that can adapt to those extremes. So lifespan is something that is oftentimes overlooked, and it nowhere, it's nowhere does this get talked about in the official requirements for pollinator plantings on the federal level. But you might want to consider this. Um, so generally speaking, we have these four different lifespans for plants. And now this is oversimplified depending on the site conditions or the environmental stressors or other factors. There are plants that move in between gray areas that sometimes behave as an annual and sometimes behave as a short-lived perennial depending on where they're grown in, in context. Um, so keep in mind that this is, this is an oversimplification of biology. But generally speaking, you've got your annuals, they live for one year, you've got your biennials, they produce vegetation their first year, and then they flower and reproduce their second year. You have short-lived perennials, which live for like three to five years, and then they'll die out. And then you have long-lived perennials, um, that live for five or plus years. And then there's some perennials that you need to kind of keep in the forethought of your mind as a seed mix designer that are extraordinarily long-lived perennials. A lot of things in the silphium genus like cup plant and prairie dock and compass plant. There are recorded individual plants that have been living for over a hundred years. And we're not quite sure how long they live, but they live for over a century, potentially. <laughs> and so that can be really important to consider. Lifespan can be really important to consider when you're thinking about seeding rates of individual species. We're gonna go in more about seeding rates later, but generally speaking, you wanna overseed your annuals and your biennials 
because their lifespans are short and you want their seeds to kind of keep going in, in that um, community. And long-lived perennials, especially silviums, you want to underseed. Okay, so seed sources are very important to consider. Um, we're going to kind of breeze through this because with federal programs, you guys are required to have your seed, pure live seed. That's not the case if you're not enrolling in a federal program. And so it is important anyone, anyone who is buying seed from Prairie Moon Nursery can hold themselves to the federal standards and ask for pure live seed and get that. And so if you want 100% pure live seed, if you want to get your seed tests, if you want to have this record, you're going to need it if you have an NRCS contract. But even if you don't have an NRCS contract, you can get this information. And it's, it's good to have because not all seed is created equal. There is seed out on the seed market right now that tests as low as 30% PLS. And there's seed that is tested at like 99% PLS. And you oftentimes get what you pay for. And so seed that tests out really low is really cheap. Seed that tests out really high is probably going to be more expensive because you're getting a better quality. So it's always good to be savvy and ask for tests or pure live seed. So seeding rates, I think, is one of the more complex aspects of seed mix design that can be difficult to suss out, especially if you are not a prairie biologist and don't have a lot of experience with seeding rates. So the big distinction that I think it's very important to make in an agricultural context is that there's a difference between percent by weight versus percent by seed count. Oftentimes in the agricultural world, we are talking about percent by weight. We're talking about, I need X pounds of corn or soy or cover crop. And because within those crops, A, there's, there's relatively few species that we're using as agricultural commodity crops. And those weights are pretty standardized across the nation. And so one pound of corn, one place equals one pound of corn, in another place and it's pretty it's pretty standardized within the agricultural world yeah it's not so for the native seed world as i said there are at least at prairie moon over 700 species of plants that we have available um, and out there in the wild of course there's thousands of plants and their seed size is not standardized at all you can have seeds that are really really large and you can have seeds that are extraordinarily tiny. So rushes, for example, things in the, the genus Juncus are known for having super tiny seeds, almost like dust. Like you can't even physically pick one seed up because it is so small. And if you just go by seed weight, you know, one, one ounce, one ounce of a Juncus can have over one million seeds in it. And so that is a very low weight. That's gonna show up on your seed mix design looking like nothing, like a piddly amount, but it actually represents a massive amount of seeds that are going down. Um, so it's very important to know this distinction between percent by weight and percent by count. Plant life cycle is another thing you wanna take into consideration when you're doing your seeding rates. At Prairie Moon, we tend to overseed the short-lived species and the underseed long-lived species. So for example, we often overseed partridge pea and black-eyed Susans, which are short-lived or annual native plants, because they kind of act like a native cover crop in your seed mix. If you don't have another cover crop, like a conventional cover crop that you're using, these are species that will go in, flower early, give you some idea of if your planting is successful in the first and second years, which can often be some of the most nerve-wracking times of the prairie because your restoration isn't going to look like much if you started from seed until about years three through five. And so it's nice to have a visual indicator, something that's blooming early on that will give you an idea that things are going okay. And these species are usually not very competitive and you see them in the beginning where you have all this open space, that open space is going to shortly be occupied by other native plants that are maturing. And so that level of 
yellow, usually you get a giant yellow bloom during your first few years, that's going to kind of peter out and then the seed mix will kind of regulate itself after that and you'll get more diversity of blooms. And so you don't have to worry about overseeding annual plants. They will get checked into balance once those more long-lived species get established. And then for things like the silphiums especially, um, they're very long-lived species. And so you do not want to seed them at a very high rate, or you could perhaps end up with a large flush of these very large um, native plants. And even in some of the eastern states that we work with, this is actually, um, some of the silphiums are restricted because they can get so aggressive, even though they are native plants. And so for those, you know, keep in mind, you might have a very low seeding rate, but each one of those seeds that germinates and becomes a plant is going to potentially live for a century. And every year it's going to produce, be producing its own new viable set of seeds. And so if you start with an overseeded planting heavy on silphium, give it 20 years and it might be just a river of silphium. So that is important to keep in mind. And this is sometimes, sometimes we question seed mixes that, that are on cost share contracts and saying like, ooh, do you really want to seed that at that higher rate? And maybe we'll recommend, you know, trying to lower um, that, those percentages or raise percentages of species based upon these behaviors that we see out in the field. And then another thing to consider um, with seeding rates is your seed size. And so this is kind of related to life cycle, but more, more like their, their reproductive strategy. And so some plants have a reproductive strategy where they spend their finite amount of energy producing a small number of high quality seeds. And therefore, you throw that seed out there, you're very likely to get a very high percentage germination rate of the seeds that you put out. Again, silphium is one of these. It's very, very viable. It's really easy to grow. It starts well from seed. So you don't really need a whole lot of seed because it's so high quality, because the plant spent a lot of energy focusing on a few, a smaller number of seeds. And then there's other plants that have their reproductive strategy, which is slightly different, where they're spending their finite amount of energy making a really large amount of perhaps lower quality seed. And so one seed really realistically is not going to equate to one plant. You're going to need to put a lot of seed out there if you are going to want to see these plants show up with any visual presence in the prairie. And so these species that I've highlighted, I want to point out just a few things. So the first one is white wild indigo, Baptisias, the wild indigos. These are often underseeded because of seed size. They have big, robust seeds, and they show up very well from seed in prairie plantings, so you don't need a whole lot of it in order for it to show up well. So even though, look at percent by weight is 1%, percent by count, 0.09%. There's not a whole lot of seeds in here relative to the other species, but we know we know that if you seed more than two ounces per acre of white wild indigo, you are going to get an overwhelming amount of white wild indigo in your planting. And so here it's just at one ounce. So it looks percent by count to be very underseeded, but if, if one ounce will do just fine in a planting like this. Uh, partridge pea is the next one down. This is overseeded because of its life cycle. This is a native annual plant, and so you can overseed this like a cover crop, and it is not super competitive. It will kind of, the, the amount of partridge pea that you will see in your prairie will drop off after about year three when these other plants grow up and start to compete with it in a, in a more robust way. So here you can see we have four to 16 ounces that can be recommended in a, in a prairie planting. So next one, the lobelias, um, often used in areas that are wetter um, environments. So this would both be great blue lobelia and cardinal flower. And these 
These plants are one of those um, one of those plants that produce a large amount of relatively low quality seed. And so you need to put a lot of seed out there if you want your lobelias to show up with any amount of visual presence in your prairie. And so this says it's almost 7% of the seed mix by count, but it's only 0.25% by weight. A large number of seeds, very, very, very small volume and weight because the seeds themselves are so, so tiny. And so this looks, quote unquote, like it's overseeded, but really, this is extraordinarily underseeded. We recommend one to four ounces per acre to get this to show up. This mix is 0.25 ounces. And so in this mix, I'd be very skeptical that the money you spent on great blue lobelia is going to be worth it because it's probably going to be drowned out by other species because there won't be very many of them that show up and they're going to get buried within the sea of other species. And so we might recommend that, yeah, we know it looks like it's high, but it's misleading by the way that the plant behaves out in the field. Another one that is a uh, a great one to use kind of as a native cover crop is your black-eyed Susans. Again, we recommend a pretty high seeding rate, anywhere from one to 10 ounces per acre is gonna be just fine. Just like the partridge pea, it's gonna be very visually present. It'll maybe will be like all you see for the first year or two. And you'll think like, did we just plant this whole field of black-eyed Susans or what is happening here? But it's just, it's just a natural biological succession of a disturbed site. You get your annuals and your biannual pioneer species that that establish and reproduce very quickly, and they occupy the space while the slower growing perennials, more conservative species, have a time to take root and grow. Again, we've talked a lot about the silphiums. Again, we recommend only 0.5 to at the very most two ounces per acre. And we even try and shy away, try and convince people to not even go that high unless they love this plant and they don't care if in 20 years this plant kind of takes over. Um, so here, even um, at 0.25 species, it's the seed is so big and so heavy, it's almost 4% of the seed mix by weight, but it is only 0.01% by seed count. It looks very underseeded, but it's underseeded for a reason. The last example for this seed mix is the Culver's root. This is a really great plant. I love to see it in plantings. Um, but this is another one that, so this, I mean, it's not necessarily seed size that's the issue, but it is, it does not compete very well at all. And so if you put it out in the field at a low seeding rate, so this is super, super low seeding rate, 0.05 ounces, hardly any seed at all, but it looks like it's a lot of seed, 2.18% of the seed mix by seed count. And we recommend at least one to two ounces. And so Culver's root, if you, if you seed it at the rate we recommend, like if you want to see Culver's root out in your prairie, you're going to need a lot of seed out there because it does not compete well with other plants. And you might get a lot of seeds to germinate, but they're not going to compete well and they might peter out. And so you need that amount of seed out there to get it to show up. And this is an especially weird one because it grows just fine in the greenhouse without competition. If we grow this out in trays, we can get this to germinate no problem as a live plant without competition, but it behaves very differently out in a restored prairie. And so these are the kinds of nuanced complexities that if you if you haven't seen a lot of these restoration plantings go in and then what happens 25 years after you put that seed mix in these kinds of things can get overlooked but i feel like that's where prairie moon nursery has a great opportunity to work with the nrcs um, and other federal officials to help kind of tweak these mixes based upon what we've seen out in our fields when we've been doing seed mix designs for the past, you know, 30, 35 plus years um, and try and make these pollinator mixes as robust and as ecologically sound as we possibly can and make sure that people are happy with the results that they get. And they're, they're getting 
you know, you're not spending money on seed that isn't likely to show up at the seeding rates that you put it in. Um, and so, again, we are always, we don't really have industry secrets at Prairie Moon. We will share this information with, especially with NRCS officials or farmers or just interested landowners who really want to have a high quality seed mix that ends up turning out after it's growing five years as to what they envisioned uh, when they first set out. I think I just have like three more slides with other considerations. Um, you do want to think about your grasses to forb ratio. Most of these pollinator mixes from the NRCS are required to be 20 seeds um, out of 40 seeds per square foot of wildflowers. So we're hitting this 50-50 mix. That's really good. We found at Prairie Moon that that produces a really nice mix of grasses and wildflowers. So that 50-50 mark is great. Sometimes you can even go up to 70-75% wildflowers. But there is research from the Tallgrass Prairie Center um, associated with the University of Iowa that if you push the wildflower ratio higher than 70%, like you're really, a, you have an aversion to grasses, you're not really a fan, you want it mostly to be wildflowers. But if you push the ratio higher than 70, 75%, you're wasting money. That plant community will not, the, the plants will not behave in a way where that the wildflowers will grow out at that high of a ratio. The plant community tops out at about 70% wildflowers, and you can throw money at more wildflower seed, push that ratio all the way up to 99% wildflowers, come back in five years, the plant diversity is still going to max out at 70-30 um, over time. And so it doesn't really make sense to push it any higher than that. And you really do, we do get people who come to us, not from with NRCS contracts, but just landowners who come to us and ask for wildflower only seed mixes. And we do what we can to, to try and to persuade people, to convince people that that might not produce the results that you're hoping that it will. Because again, plant communities want to have these certain categories of plants within them. And if you don't fill the grass niche, Mother Nature will. And it will likely be some sort of weedy agricultural thing that blows in or an invasive species will occupy that space. And you don't want that. Um, and not only to mention that, but wildflowers need a matrix of grasses in order for their heavy flowers to be propped up. And if you only plant wildflowers, we see this a lot in urban locations where people want to plant really tall wildflowers like right next to their lawn they flop over. And so that's not great for pollinators, it's not great for aesthetics. Um, so you really, that grass component is really important and shouldn't be underplayed or omitted from these plantings. And then it is important to consider cost. Most of these NRCS contracts are sticking with species that are easily grown, widely available. They're very economical. But if you're a farmer and you really want specific species in there, you need to be cognizant of costs. So. Let's say you really want curly everlasting in your pollinator planting because it is a host plant for the painted lady butterfly, which is great, awesome, yes. However, this plant is difficult to produce. It's very difficult to farm. Um, therefore, it is expensive. It is $300 an ounce. You need one to three ounces per acre to get this plant to show up in a restoration planting. So you could be spending $900 an acre for one plant species. And if you have money to throw at this, great, we will absolutely hook you up with that. But if you're working with a budget, it is important to consider the cost of some of these species. And some of the species that are really coveted, like pearly everlasting, like cardinal flower, like wood betony, um, like hoary cocoon, those species are coveted and mysterious for a reason. They are very difficult to uh, farm and produce, and therefore they are either not available at all or they are very expensive when they are available. A lot of these species are also hemoparasitic, and so if you don't have the right conditions, they're not going to show up anyways. Um, so you might want to avoid some of those real finicky species, even though they are kind of gems of the native plant world, um, but they are that way for a reason. Thanks to Caitlin O'Connor from Prairie Moon Nursery. Thank you for listening to the Moses Organic Farming Podcast. 
and remember to register for the post-podcast farmer chat. Moses educates farmers in sustainable and organic agriculture. Call the Organic Answer Line to ask a specialist about organic farming and certification at 888-90-MOSES or visit mosesorganic.org slash ask. From February 22nd to the 27th, 2021, we're co-hosting a virtual conference called Growing Stronger. This collaborative conference on organic and sustainable farming will be done in partnership with several other events, including the Grassworks Conference, O-Grain Conference, the Midwest Organic Pork Conference, and the Organic Vegetable Production Conference. Registration starts December 1st, and you get $25 off for the month of December. Visit bit.ly slash growingstronger2021. Thanks again to our patron sponsor, Gemplers. Visit gemplers.com. Our theme song is Summer Fields by the Tenements. If you have a minute, please rate and review our show in your podcast app. It helps people find the show. Thanks again for listening.